Well, what is this world coming to? <laughs> yeah, maybe you've asked that question. What is this world coming to? And I would simply say this world is coming to Jesus. Whatever else is going on in this world, invariably, we are on God's timeline and we are on God's pattern for things to come. And there's nothing that's going to stand in the way of what God has intended and what he has divinely ordained even before time. That God is moving us toward an intended, to an intended purpose. The things don't just happen in our lives and they're not just happening in the world. And while it may seem to be chaotic, there is a God who is above and he's looking down below. In fact, he's not just looking down below, but he's very much involved in what's going down here underneath the sun. And he's with us and he's walking with us and he is moving time, history toward its intended purpose. And that is ultimately the return of the king. We have just two chapters left in this study, The Return of the King, and we looked at chapter 1 last week, a response to the suffering in light of God's righteous judgment. They were suffering, they were enduring persecution, and there is a response that Paul gives them, a response that God has in light of their suffering, God's righteous judgment. God is just, and His righteous judgments are there on behalf of his people. In chapter 2 today, we're going to look at a rebuttal to the false teachers who were trying to convince others that the day of the Lord had passed. And we'll look at a definition of the day of the Lord in just a moment. And then by the time we get to chapter 3 of this short letter, Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, we will look at a rebuke of the idle and lazy believers, that's right, who use the Lord's return uh, as a cover for living off of other people. The Lord's coming back, and so we can just sort of chill out, kick back, and wait for Him to come back. We don't have to do very much, and so there is a rebuke for those who are participating in that kind of idleness or laziness. I'm going to try to remain disciplined this morning and try to stay with teaching and try not to do too much preaching, but there's a lot I need to talk to you about this morning from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And so we're looking at one of the most important scriptures related to the last days in chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians. It's often misunderstood. The person and the spirit of Antichrist is who we are talking about this morning. The person in the spirit of Antichrist becomes very important to Paul's letter to this young congregation. And he has already spoken to them, at least on this subject matter, and he's going to remind them, and he's going to remind them through this second letter. And so there are a few observations I want to make before we look at chapter 2, and observations that I think that will help keep me focused and hopefully keep us focused on this subject of the revelation of uh, the unveiling of the Antichrist and the spirit of anti Antichrist, which has prevailed even since the first coming of Christ, the spirit of Antichrist has. And so the first observation I want to make, I'll make these very quickly. One, we should not give more attention to the doomed Antichrist than we do to the victorious Christ. So whatever our conversation is, while we will camp out here for a little while, know this, that there is no one greater than Jesus. Here, I'm going to preach it now. <laughs> I'm going to have to stay disciplined. We're going to be here for three weeks. And you don't, I mean, literally, we're going to be here. Number two, we're going to have to use some caution. We must exercise some caution when it gets to identifying this person of Antichrist. Lest we fall into some kind of trap or some kind of excess. We must be careful. Three, the knowledge of the future that the Lord allows us to possess through his word is in order that it would shape how we live now. That's what God is allowing us. He's allowing us to get a peek behind the curtain as the curtain is drawn back so that we can, we can live more fully and completely this life that he's given us in the here and now. Emphasis is here in chapter 2 on the preparation, not speculation, concerning the Antichrist. There will be enough, tr trust me, as we look at this passage of Scripture, but the purpose is a pastoral letter. It's written to encourage them. And so its emphasis is on preparation, not speculation. Number five, regardless of our persecution and regardless of the persecution and the suffering of those Thessalonian believers, it's not God's judgment on your life. He said that 
the children of God are going to be spared the wrath and 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verses 9 and 10 and, and other passages of Scripture help us to understand that we will never incur the wrath of God as a child of God. You know why? Because Jesus did. He incurred the wrath on our behalf. We will not experience that. And then the last thing I would say is finally, one day when it's all said and done, we win <laughs> because Jesus won. That, that's how this all works out. And so I want you to take your Bible and look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. And first of all, we're going to be encouraged to be aware of the deception, ultimately the deception that Antichrist will seek to provide in misleading other people. Now we beseech you, we urge you, we strongly encourage you, is the idea here, brethren. He's speaking to believers. And we urge you on the basis of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, exhortation, encouragement comes through the understanding of the return of Christ. That's how you're properly educated or encouraged. And by our gathering together unto him. So by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the fact that we will gather together someday with him at his return, upon his arrival, the church will gather together. We will be brought together in Christ Jesus. On that basis, I encourage you. I urge you not to be shaken in your mind, not to be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us as that day of Christ is at hand. And so he's encouraging them and he wants them to measure what they are hearing because apparently, and we don't have all the details here, but apparently what's going on in the, in the early church at Thessalonica is that there are those who are, uh, who are trying to circumvent Paul's teaching. In fact, they're even attributing possibly an, an additional letter that Paul wrote this and say that you're in the midst of the day of the Lord, that this day of the Lord, this day of great judgment upon the earth that's going to take place, this is the reason you're suffering. The reason you're being persecuted is because of this great day that is abiding, and that's why you're experiencing what you're experiencing. But Paul is saying, no, I didn't write that letter. Don't let somebody trouble you. Don't let somebody deceive you. Don't let somebody convince you that the day of the Lord has already come and gone, that you're experiencing experiencing this, this time of, of great tribulation. And so he's already instructed them concerning this, the day of the Lord. Now, what was the day of the Lord? Now, I'm going to read several passages and, and, and just follow them on the screen, write them down because it's a lot. And I normally don't do this on Sunday morning, but I think you need to understand, begin in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 13 in verse 6, if that passage could be put up there on the screen, Isaiah 13 Verse 6, because Paul has instructed them concerning uh, the day of the Lord. And it's a time that will bring, bring direct and dramatic and drastic judgment upon the earth. Verse, verse 6, he says this. How you, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Zephaniah 1, verse 14. Verse 14, the great day of the Lord is near. These are the prophets of the Old Testament. Hundreds of years talk in advance talking of the day of the Lord. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near. It is great. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. I will bring distress upon men. They shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh shall be as dung. So the prophets were saying this day is going to come. They knew about it from the Old Testament. This time is going to arrive. But he's assuring them that time has not come. That that's not what they're experiencing. That persecution and suffering is characteristic of Christians in every age. But he's not saying that the day of the Lord is, is not going to occur. He's just saying it's not happening now. Don't think that what you're going through now is that day. It's not. So he's trying, to, he's trying to correct them. He's trying to say this day of the Lord, this day of great tribulation that's going to come upon the earth is going to be intense. And it's going to be in a time of intense earthly judgment that will come upon this earth. 
And for those who do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who will have been left behind, it is going to be a great day. It's going to be a day of great tribulation. So Paul is trying to uh, remind them or to remove any confusion that has been brought to them by some of the misguided teachers of their day that are attributing Paul as saying that this day has already occurred. So they may have thought that, well, hey, you know, this is it. But he's saying, no, it's not. It's not going to happen until this gathering of God's people has already occurred. Into the rapture itself, in 1 Thessalonians 4, that the rapture itself will have taken place. And then after such day, after such time, this great day of judgment where the wrath of God will be poured out upon the earth, that's when it will take place. So don't worry, you won't be here when it takes place. This is what theologians call the pre-tribulational rapture. That is before the great time of tribulation, the pr- before all of that, that the church, the body of Christ, having believed in Jesus, waiting for his return, we're going to be caught up and we're going to be taken out and we're going to be with the Lord. That's what's going to take place. And so in the pre-tribulational point of view, we are raptured out. Now, there, is, there are great scholars and there are people that I consider to be well-intended and certainly um, that I would say are, you know, are hold to truth as I would hold the truth but we may differ on this they may say no we're actually going to have to go through this great tribulation and at the end the Lord will come back I understand that there there is that position and I am somewhat sympathetic to it to be honest with you because from a pastoral standpoint I want us to be careful that in the event that we have to go through this tribulation time that we know that the Lord's going to keep us he's not going to save us and then let us fall by the wayside during this time And that whatever wrath is poured out would not be poured out upon believers in this time. But it is my understanding, at least from these verses and other passages of Scripture, that the the body, the weight of of Scripture indicates that we're going to be caught up and we're going to be taken out and we're going to be spared this great event, this day of the Lord. And so beware of the deception that can come. Measure what you hear by the certainty of His coming. But also don't be deceived because the man of sin... Antichrist will show himself and his true character. Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there is a falling away first. Now he's going to give three indications. There's going to be a, a falling away, and then that man of sin, which is just another name for Antichrist, uh, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or, or that is worship, so that he as God will sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. It's a little wordy here, but I want us to think about it for, for just a moment. So there's this warning. Don't let anybody deceive you or mislead you. You got to know, folks, and I hope that everything you read on the Internet and everything you listen, I hope that every preacher that you listen to, that you're listening to them with a critical ear. Number one, let me can I just say this on a pastoral note. Those preachers that you listen to uh, via the Internet or on television or whatever else, you know something? They don't know you and you don't know them. And I trust that they will not be showing up at your bedside uh, in the event that you're sick. They won't be there in your hard times of life. So whatever you may be sending their way, you need to understand it's the local church that Jesus died for, okay? Now, I'm not against all these, you know, some good Bible teaching that does exist, but be careful because we are so gullible in these days. In fact, one of the things that will characterize the end times is that people will just want, they will, they will they'll want to have teachers that can, you know, that just scratch their ear. Teachers that will say the kinds of things that they like so that when they leave church, they'll feel all good, warm, and fuzzy when they leave. And that's the end of it. And make you feel better about, you know, about how you're living a sinful life. And because and you, you, we want to hear people affirm us in the wrong direction that we're going. You ever notice that? But I'm preaching now. And I get, okay. <laughs> stay disciplined. Call and help me stay disciplined. So the man of sin, the son of perdition, th- there, there are three, three things that are going to happen. First of all, there's going to be a falling away, this apostasia. This is the Greek word that is used here. It means a revolt. There's going to be this departure. There's going to be this abandoning uh, of the positions one held, once held. We're seeing this even today in our time. You're seeing people who used to be orthodox or mainline, people who held to uh, historical Christian truth, they're actually abandoning the truth. Well, in that day, what's going to happen is there's going to be a free fall. It's going to be a free fall, and, and, and people are just going to abandon any sense of what is the truth and will run to just about anything. 1 Timothy 1 uh, in verse, in verse uh, 
uh, 1 Timothy 4, if you have that scripture there, 1, 1 Timothy 4, let me, let me read some of the passages of scripture. But the Spirit, the Spirit explicitly, says, explicitly says that in the latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits, doctrines of demons, by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. Another passage of Scripture, 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5. Paul writes to young Timothy, he says this, But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, and irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power and avoid such men as these interesting enough it doesn't say that they won't be religious he's just saying they're going to be all these things and they're going to be religious isn't isn't that what he's saying in verse 5 all of this whole list this 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 moral tsunami and, and they have a form of godliness in other words there's some kind of religious activity going on in their life but there's no power to me this is one of the most challenging verses for people who attend church that we would come week after week after week and we would experience a little bit of religious activity, but there would be no demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Something is wrong in our lives when all we have is a shell of a religion. Something's wrong. And it will characterize the church in the last days. It will characterize the people of the last days. People will become more religious in a sense but they will become more sinful in that, same, in that same journey. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound teaching, but wanting to have their ears tickled. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and they will turn away their ears from the truth, and they will turn aside to myth. This is the characteristic of the last days. So this falling away is going to occur. This man of sin, the Antichrist, is going to be revealed. And then this, he's called the son, he's called the son of perdition. He is a destroyer. Ultimately, what Satan wants to do, what the Antichrist will want to do, is he ultimately has a problem with who God is. He will, de- he will seek to dethrone God. You know that's what he's been attempting to do since Adam and Eve in the garden, right? That's why he, he, he lured them, he, he, he deceived them, he tried to convince them, and he did, he convinced them. Ultimately, it's not enough for Satan to be a worshiper of God. He, he rebelled against God and God's authority, and he seeks to dethrone God and ultimately destroy mankind and to deceive mankind. And so he is the son of perdition. He is a destroyer of lives. Jesus said this, the thief comes forth but to steal, kill and destroy but i've come that you might have life and that you might have life abundantly that's what jesus you see the contrast and so he will come he will he will come as the son of perdition the only other reference that we find to the son of perdition is a reference to judas isn't that interesting who sold jesus out in the temple for 30 pieces of silver in a sense it was judas who desecrated the temple by selling jesus out wasn't it And it is the Antichrist, the person of the Antichrist, ultimately, who will seek to desecrate the temple. He will seek to, well, ultimately, he wants to be worshipped. That's what he wants. Antichrist wants to be worshipped. That's what Satan ultimately wants. He he wants the worship of of humanity. He wanted the worship of Jesus. This is why he tempted Jesus in the temptation stories that we have concerning Christ. And so these things are going to take, these things are going to, uh, to occur. In fact, the Bible tells us there's more of a description in in verse 4. He opposes and he exalts himself above all that is called God. He is anti-Christ. He is against him. And and all that is worship. He sets himself up in the temple. Uh, we, We see historically where this has actually occurred. 
you have Roman authorities. For instance, it was Antiochus Epiphanes who, in 167 BC, who did just that. He, he built a statue of Zeus. He brought it into the temple, and he, and he erected the statue in the temple area itself, and then he sacrificed pigs in the temple to desecrate the temple. That's what he did. And so while he was not the Antichrist, he was of the spirit of Antichrist. And ever since then, we, we see that. There, there's always been this, uh, this effort by humanity, the spirit of Antichrist, that will ultimately give way to the person of Antichrist that, that will come. He's called the beast and other passages of Scripture. That's interesting, isn't it? The, the beast in Revelation 13. Do you have that passage of Scripture there? Revelation 13. Revelation 13 says, says this. Let me find my passage of Scripture. Um, Revelation 13. I want to find my place here. Revelation 13 in verse 5. And there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. That is those who dwell in heaven. And it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb that has been slain. Second Peter 3 verse, verses 3 and following says this. Knowing, know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continued just as it was from the beginning of creation. Revelation 13, verse 2 and 4. And the beast that I saw like a leopard, its feet were like a, a bear's, and its mouth was like a, a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave its power, speaking of Satan himself. The dragon in Revelation is... Satan and the dragon gave his power and his throne and his great authority one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound but its mortal wound was healed and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast this is why many uh, 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 Bible scholars uh, pro prophecy scholars said that the Antichrist in some way will be wounded this is why some have suggested that Ronald Reagan by the way was the Antichrist that he was wounded and then he was healed as a result of that there's been all kinds of notions you know Napoleon and, and this one and that one and Nicholas Carpathia you know and the uh, you remember Nicholas he's a fictional character by the way okay left behind serious just so you know that he's not a real person but there's archetype of Antichrist and so the thing is, is that this person is going to exert himself at a point in time in history, and he will seek to deceive. He's called the beast. How would you like that as your secondary name? Son of perdition, man of sin, the beast. That's who he is. And ultimately, he wants to destroy those who follow after Christ. First John 2 and verse 18 says this, Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many, many Antichrist, whereby we know that it is the last times. What was John saying? He's saying that there is a person of Antichrist who will come, but the spirit of Antichrist was already existent in John's day. Well, what is he, why is he warning them? He's cautioning them. He's saying, don't be deceived. This man of sin, this person, will reveal his true character. Now, what Paul is encouraging the church, because it's a pastoral letter, he's encouraging them, and he wants them to know that they will be okay. Okay, that, that's ultimately, the, what is the main idea here? Even if you walk away with different understanding from this passage of Scripture, and we might even differ in our point of view, the main idea is that the day of the Lord has not yet come. And... When it does, these things are going to take place, but you'll be okay. You're going to be okay because you have believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And so don't be deceived. The man of sin will show his true character. And then anyone who sees themselves as God, be very cautious. Or they carry themselves like a, as though they are God. They may not be willing yet at this moment to say, hey, by the way, just want you to know I'm the Antichrist. It's not like he's going to show up and say that. Hey, uh, we run a full page ad in the New York Times. I'm the Antichrist. That guy's not going to show up like that. 
You're going to have to be discerning and, and you're going to have to understand. You're, not, you're going to have to be careful. You're going to have to know God's word. You're going to have to be careful not to place, pray, place your trust in these religious types of leaders because he will be a religious person. These religious type people that, that can be convincing at times. Be very careful. That's why, and this is not to exalt, in, to exalt me, but it is to exalt local church pastors. Local church pastors who walk with you shoulder to shoulder, whatever church you may be at or church you're attending, that's why we need local pastors. Pastors are shepherds, under shepherds, who care for you, who care about your soul. They do more, and we do more than simply showing up at the hospital. We do that sometimes as well, but we care for your soul. We want to know that you're okay spiritually. That, that, that's people like that. That's who you want in your life. And if you don't think you have that kind of pastor or pastors here in this church, you know what I would suggest? I suggest you find a church where that kind of pastor exists and get there and plug in and be a part of that kind of church. And if it's not this church, if you don't believe that, well, that's okay. Move on. Go to church where you know the pastor cares for you. Now, I think I care for you. Okay? Okay, I just don't want to be too defensive now. But, you know. but I just want you to know, if you ever get the feeling from this pulpit or any pulpit that the pastors of the church don't care for you, not just your physical well-being, but for your soul, then you ought to move on to somewhere where that pastor does care about your spiritual well-being and your equipping and encouragement as a believer in Christ so that you can be a fellow disciple of who Jesus is. So be careful of anyone who sets themselves up as, as God, which ultimately the Antichrist will do according uh, to verse 4, that he will do so. Now, if this was unimportant, let me just, a, a word, uh, while there is a word of caution to begin the message, if this were an unimportant subject, why did Paul talk about it so much? Why did, he, why did he write about it? Why did he write new Christians about it? I mean, these are new Christians. You would have thought, well, let's, let's get them grounded in the Word. Let's let, them, let's let them read a whole lot of other material first, you know, and let's, let, let's get them grounded, and then we'll eventually get to this subject. Uh, he is writing them, having only spent anywhere from three, three weeks to a couple of months with them. He has spent a short time with them. So he, have, he apparently thinks it's important for them to understand at least something about what's going to take place. So be careful. Be careful. Secondly, be ready for the delusion in verses 6 and following. Be aware of the deception that will come. Be ready for the delusion in verse 6. He says, and now you know, and now you know what is holding him back. That uh, literally, if you're using the King James Bible, it says, now you know what withholdeth, okay? But now you know what is holding him back, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity, does already it's already at work. He's already at work. Only he who now is restraining will let or will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So he's letting him know that when he does finally manifest himself, unveil who he is, rest assured that shortly thereafter, the Lord will bring judgment upon him. He may think that he's going to exalt himself as God. He's going to usurp the authority of God. He's going to place himself upon the hearts of, of men and women here on this earth, and he's going to do so. But ultimately, Jesus wins. Ultimately, he's going to bring judgment upon him. But until he does that, there are some things that are going to happen. Now, this is a very challenging passage of Scripture that most Bible scholars would concur. There are details that we would love that Paul would have included, but he's letting them know there are some things that they apparently knew that he talked to them about that are not written in the letters. And so we don't have the, we don't have the benefit of knowing that. So in, in some ways, we're taking Scripture and trying to compare Scripture and say, what's going on? What's holding the Antichrist back from unleashing this hell on earth, this, 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 this wrath upon the earth, this, this persecution upon the earth, what's holding him back from that? And I think that probably the most logical thing, some have suggested, well, it's the governmental systems, and some have suggested that maybe it's Satan himself who's holding him back, doesn't want the Antichrist fully revealed at this time. But I think probably the best way to understand this is that the restrainer, the restrainer in this verse, the one who's holding Antichrist from fully unleashing his power on this earth and destruction on this earth, is the Holy Spirit. And that the Holy Spirit 
indwelling believers at, at, at that time and in this time is holding back the full lawlessness of the Antichrist. Uh, and he, because he's a lawless person. He has no sense of the law of God. He will not abide according to the law. He will reject God's law and he will live beyond God's law. And so the holding back of Antichrist in each age and until his final, until his reveal, is ultimately the presence of the Holy Spirit in believers' lives. Now, what would happen is if we as believers are raptured out of here and the presence of believers are no longer here on this earth, empowered by the Holy Spirit, that now Antichrist is no longer restrained. He is now able as a man of lawlessness, as he's described, is to now unleash havoc upon the earth. Now, he doesn't do that right off the bat because he's still gaining popularity and confidence of the, of the world. In, in fact, when you do a more detailed study of, of Antichrist, you realize that he's probably brokering some kind of peace deal in the Middle East with Israel, trying somehow to broker some kind of deal where he gains worldwide notoriety. Uh, there's many ways that we can look at this, and, and I realize some of them are speculative, but in some ways he's... he's, he's exerting himself in a way that he gains leadership in the world so that enough people believe him to follow him and to follow him in such a way that they are then deceived by his wickedness. But ultimately, the Lord will judge him. And so, so the Holy Spirit, present in believers, is providing a restraint on the earth so that he cannot yet unleash his full fury on the earth. You ever notice, well, I, I particularly noticed this in some of the hurricanes when law enforcement left areas because they had to, just because they were trying to save their own lives, and that when there was no presence of law in, in law enforcement there, that people just began to sort of do whatever they wanted to do. It's called lawlessness. Why would you as a Christian why would you as a Christian not do something like that even when law enforcement is not there? Because you don't need law enforcement. You have the law of God written on your heart. You're not going to do some things. You know why? It'd be one thing to go get some water, you know, out of a store if you were just, you know, dying of thirst. We're not talking about that. But I sure hope you're not going to be walking out of a store with a 65-inch TV. You know what I'm talking about? You got me on that? Uh, you, you know what I'm saying? I, you know what? Because you don't need law enforcement present. But when law enforcement is not present, there's a propensity toward lawlessness. People just begin to do what's right in their own eyes. And, and, and the Antichrist will be guilty of this. He is the mystery of iniquity. This tremendous descriptions about who he is. And so before he can rally his full attack in verse 8, before he's able to unleash his full fury on the earth, Antichrist will ultimately will be destroyed. He will be consumed. And so we know that Christ wins the battle. I want you to see something else in verse, in verse 9. And I, and I know our time is getting away, but I, I just have to just hang in there with me a little bit longer, if you would. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. When he shows up, folks, it's not as, it's not as though he's going to show up and, and people aren't going to believe him. People will believe him. He's capable of deceiving powers, signs. I mean, things that are going to look miraculous? Don't you think Satan has power and authority? He does. He doesn't have ultimate power and authority. And this is why we have to be very careful. Just because something looks powerful or it looks like a sign, looks like it's a miracle, we need to be very careful. We need to judge as to whether or not this is something uh, from the Lord. And so the only place that we have is a place of truth to stand on. And the only place that we have truth is in God's word. So if you don't know God's word, you are candidate number one for being deceived. In fact, you're probably already being deceived. If you're the kind of Christian you like, the kind of bumper sticker Christianity, means you live your Christianity based on somebody's devotional book every, that you read. Just out, you would never read the word, just read somebody else's devotional book. That's not a good way to study the word, okay? Now, I'm not against devotional books, but that, if that's all you got is you're reading a few little devotionals every once in a while, and you're talking, about, you're, and you act like that's studying God's Word, it's not. That's not studying God's Word. 
Now, you may, may read something really nice, but the problem with that is you never learn to read God's Word for yourself. And if you never learn to read God's Word for yourself, you are candidate number one to being deceived. Because anybody can show up and quote Scripture and manipulate the Word of God, and you don't know if they're telling you the truth or not. So we must go back to the Word of God. So he's going to show up with power, with miracles, with signs. Uh, that will appear, appear meaningful and even self-affirming. And these wonders, there's going to be this sense that people are going to look at him and say, oh, wow, oh, that, that's what he's talking about, right? Like, wow, did you hear about what he did? That kind of conversation. And, and so it's going to evoke a sense of, of awe and admiration. He's not going to be some horn kind of creature that when you look at him, it's going to be grotesque. No, he's going to be someone who's very appealing, in every way of of what it means to appeal to another human being. So overwhelmingly, people will will be deceived. Verse 11, and so this mystery of iniquity will be consumed by the Lord's coming. Satan's mouthpiece will come in power to those who do not love the truth. And number three, a great falling away will occur, bringing damnation to those who don't believe the truth. Now verse 11 says, and for this cause God shall send them strong delusion. Look who's sending the delusion. This is, it may throw you for a loop. For this, God, for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. God is going to send a delusion. Those who refuse to believe the truth are going to continue to abide in lies, and they're just going to be deceived. They want to be deceived. Behind, behind, really, ultimately, the delusion, the deception, um, is their great refusal. They don't want to believe. And Romans 1 says that at some point, when people cease to worship the, cre- the Creator, you know what they begin to do? They begin to worship the creation. And you can't reason with people. You notice that? You notice some of the lack of reasoning that's going on today? You ever hear people have conversation in the news? There's a lot of topics. I better not go there right now. But it's amazing how intellectual people can... It, we are so consumed with the environment as Christians. We ought to be good stewards of it. But we have ceased to worship the Creator. We want to worship the creation. It has become our God. It's what's happened in our society, at least for some who are way out on the fringes, on the edges... So this strong delusion, as people refuse truth, God allows them to experience the consequence of of falsehood. That's what happens. He said, okay, so if you don't want to believe the truth, then you're going to believe anything I send your way, and they will just fall into that pit of unbelief, the consequence of their own choices, believing the lie that Antichrist is God. God will send them this delusion. They will experience the result ultimately of their own choices. And isn't that what God's righteous judgment is anyways? People are ultimately going to experience the consequence of their choices. Not just the consequence of their choices, but their willingness to say, this is what I believe. This, I don't care. I'm gonna, you can't tell me anything different. Ever talk to anybody like that? You, I mean, listen, don't bring truth into the matter. Don't bring logic into the matter. Don't bring reason into the matter. I don't care what you tell me. I'm not going to believe it. Okay, well, great. You're a candidate for being deluded. You're a candidate for being misguided. You're a candidate for being ultimately sucked into the way that you believe, and the consequence of what you believe is going to lead you to destruction. That's what's happening. If you're the kind of person who never listens to anybody else, you're a candidate for this. You're a candidate for this, that they would all... Wow, this is strong that they would all be damned who believe not the truth. Rejecting truth brings damnation, separation from God, God's righteous judgment for sin. If if God did not bring his judgment upon sin, what kind of judge would he be? We would stand up and oppose any judge in the court who would overlook an injustice. So what kind of judge is God if he overlooks sin he's not God then he's not God so God's righteous judgment for sin is in keeping with who he is you reject the truth 
And then you will embrace wickedness. And when you embrace wickedness, you know what happens? You will experience God's righteous judgment. That's the way it works. You reject the truth. Mark it down. That's what he said. You reject the truth. You will embrace wickedness. When you embrace wickedness, you will experience God's judgment. That's the way it works. Because God loves us and cares enough about us to, to, to bring about earthly consequences that we might be spared eternal ones. And so the idea is that if you think it will become easier to believe, I, I think this is, let me, let me get to it. If, if, if you think it's going to become easier to believe in these days, you're thinking, hey, I'm holding out when this day happens and maybe all these Christians get raptured out of here and then I wonder, oh, no, I missed it. You're going to think, well, but I think I'm going to believe at that time. But actually the scripture indicates that while some will believe, it will become much more difficult to believe in that day and that hour because of the oppression of antichrist whose one world government will be established in such a way that even even to eat even to trade even to do business with one another will be governed by this person in this system of antichrist it will not be easy in that day and so the last thing i want to i want to say is this we need to be strong in our decision to stand firm in the truth we need to be strong. If you notice in verses 13 and following, I'm going to let you read that. But just four, four words that I want you to think about. Number one, he says, we are chosen. We are chosen. And we are called. And we should be courageous. And in doing so, we can be comforted. Okay, four words. We are God's chosen people. That, that's, what he, that's the term that he uses in verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through th sanctification of the Spirit and the belief of the truth. You know what God did? He gloriously saved you. And that's a beautiful word that God has chosen us. It means that through his own heart toward us and his love, that God's grace toward us that would sanctify us, that would save us and change us and continuously change us that we are God's chosen people. If you believe in the Lord, you say, well, who are God's chosen? Well, that's a deep subject, but let me just put it in simple terms. If you believe in Jesus, you're a part of God's chosen. Okay, it's that simple. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, and if believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, you've confessed upon him, you're a part of God's called out people. Called to live a courageous life. Whereunto he called you, verse 14. See, I'm not making these words up. He called you by our gospel. You see the idea? So what is this world coming to? He said, I don't know, but Pastor, you've got to land this thing. We're landing it right now. What is this world coming to? This world is coming to Jesus, one way or another. And the spirit, as well as the person of Antichrist that will be revealed, and there's certainly much more to this subject, that will be revealed in the days to come, will be a serious matter of God's judgment upon the earth. This day of the Lord is not something that you have to fear because the Lord Jesus Christ incurred that wrath, the righteous judgment of God toward me and my sin. God completely righteous, right in judging me as I need to be judged, knowing that I deserved to be punished, knowing all of those things, he sent his son to die for me. That's what he did. And when Jesus died on the cross, he then incurred on himself the righteous judgment of the Father so that I wouldn't have to and you wouldn't have to. And salvation is really that simple and profound, all in the same thing, that if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have nothing to fear you have truth to abide in, a foundation to stand on, a salvation that is yours, a calling from heaven. You have the gospel at your, at, 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 at your hands to believe and receive the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ so that when the spirit and the person of Antichrist arise, you have nothing to be fearful of. Father, we thank you that you meet us, that you're not through with us. Lord, in so many ways that um, your word speaks to where we are. 
I know this is a heavy message and it's overwhelming in some ways. So much to consider. But I pray, Lord, that we will understand that you are trying to speak and to bring truth to bear upon our lives. That we will believe the truth and that we will not be deceived by, by others. That we will know when the truth is being spoken because we have a sure word of prophecy in your word that you've given us. Lord, I pray for your church. I pray for your people here. God, in this, your church, that we will know your word and we'll be more committed than ever to really learning and growing and understanding so that, so that we won't be misguided when we hear teaching, when we hear things, when we read, when we listen to music or whatever it is, that the different outlets that we receive information, that we'll be able to hear and understand and have discerning hearts and that we'll be able to measure what we hear based upon the standard of your word. We thank you for that. We love you in Jesus' name.